Hey, it's Josephine from The Point Shop. We are speaking with professor, dance historian, author, just all around amazing human being. Professor Jennifer Fisher is going to make all of my nerdy point shoe dreams come true. We're going to be talking about her point shoe collection that she has accumulated over how long? I started in the late 80s. I have a lot from the 90s. Okay. And I probably stopped collecting almost 10 years ago, so they only go to a certain point. What was the reason behind starting this point shoe collection? I think it was because I'm one of those people who trained to be a Russian ballerina even though I was living in the middle of the United States. So when I stopped, I still loved ballet and I went into a bookstore and I saw a pair of point shoes of my favorite dancer, who was Karen Kane. That is the first pair I collected. I don't know why I just had a fascination with the shoe. It's incredible. I borrowed a couple of historical shoes from my friend Lena DeMarco, probably from the 19th century, they're not dated. But these are the oldest shoes. And they are what maybe Jane Austen era, they would be wearing to a ball. Oh my gosh. So they have a bow, which dancing shoes still do. These are very light satin shoes, decorative ribbons. And if you look at the sole on them, they have not yet shortened it for ballet. The sole has already started to come in. So this is for people who are doing line dancing, contra dance, galliard. Ballet started as a social dance in the courts. It got very formal. And then everybody could dance at balls. When dancers start to professionalize, mainly in the 18th century, you can really imagine women backstage wearing these shoes that were ballroom dancing shoes and deciding that if you want to have the beautiful foot that starts to be pointed with a gorgeous arch, you're going to get a better looking foot if you shorten this. Nobody knows who invented the point shoe. Right. It was maybe suggested by Diderot's ballets where people flew on wires and just touched down briefly to look unearthly and to fly across. They might have thought, wouldn't it be interesting to stand at the tip of your toes? So I imagine all of the female dancers saying, you know, what's next? What can we do? And they started putting maybe cardboard in the sole of the shoe a bit. They maybe pressed a little cotton in the tip of the shoe. They darned the heck out of them, perhaps, to get them more strong so they could stand on them. And then eventually, shoemakers take over and start to make the shoe on a wooden form. Is that called a last? last. Yes, on a wooden last, layering, putting glue in it, hardening it. But until that point, they really took a shoe as flimsy as this and made it into something they could barely stand on. I heard somebody presenting one time and said men were inventing the point shoe and I said no, women invented the point shoe, this technological tool that they did with their handicrafts, with the stuffing it full of whatever they had and darning it and then strengthening their feet enough because point work is a macho sort of thing. Right. As delicate as the ballerina looks, it's something that men will, until the current age, have not done. Wow. Women have done it and help the shoe progress. That is amazing. So and women invented point shoes. <laughs> unnamed women. One of the comparisons I always make is the fact that feet used to be, in general, very tiny. Eventually, they get very, very big. Um, oh. Yekaterina Maximova, Maximova, probably. This is a pair that a student of SAB gave me. I think her name was Christina Reyes. That is fascinating. Look at, like, you can put this shoe inside the shoe. The Freed's representative at the National Ballet of Canada told me that American dancers had the biggest feet in the world. Now for ballet, this is fine. Big old banana feet look beautiful on stage. True. All over the world, feet are getting better. But Freed's had to keep making wider and wider shoes. And that's good nutrition. This is smaller than a quarter. This is insane. Be grateful, all of my babies, all my dancers watching. <laughs> this is what you're dancing on now. It's an evolution. It's the fact that dancers wanted to do more things on their toes. Your 
feet were supposed to come to a point <laughs> back right. then. Because it was more about aesthetics, I'm sure. And now it's about the functionality. This is a six and a half in Freed's, which is one of the most popular sizes. It looks huge compared to these tiny shoes, but this is a normal size now. 10 years ago, Russian Point only went up to a size 42. Now it goes up to 47. So just in a decade, they increase their sizing from 42 to 47. It's a huge difference, but I think you're right. Feet are getting bigger and bigger. This is also an excellent example of what the Russians used to do to their shoes. In 1988 until 91, when the Iron Curtain came down, not a single Russian dancer used elastics on the heel. Not a single Western dancer didn't have elastic on the heel. Mm. And I was struggling to understand this. At the time, they didn't teach English in Russia, so we were dealing with schoolgirl French. Pourquoi? Um, no elastic. <laughs> <laughs> and they explained to me that they could adjust the heel. So they've opened the casing. Oh, I see. None of the Russian shoes had the drawstring. And they said, if you adjust the vamp, then it keeps the heel on. That's really hard to do. I thought this was an additional piece that was sewn on, but it's the casing that's opened up because this is a hack that we teach our dancers. If they have very narrow heels, they have problems with the heel staying on, so we will sew on an additional elastic piece across the back this way to keep the heel on. So this is a hack that we do. But this is opening up the casing. How fascinating. There is one shoe in here that is very odd. Actually, it used to be dyed yellow. It has faded. It was part of a dance in the Nutcracker. Mm. It's the Chinese. Yes, it's not actually the yellow point shoe that is the most offensive part of some of the Chinese dances. Oh yes. In the Nutcracker, it's oh, the yes. yellow face. Right. <laughs> For years, dancers had to wear yellow point shoes, yellow makeup, mm -hmm. and now, thanks to Final Bow for Yellow Face, which is a movement that is helping people be culturally sensitive. Phil Chan with Georgina Paskogan, they really started a movement by getting it changed at the New York City Ballet. You can easily revision your Absolutely. Nutcracker to reflect customs and not reflect injurious stereotypes. Yeah. That's a big part of ballet history. It took this long to even have that conversation. And any ballet people can figure out how not to insult people who come mm -hmm. to the Nutcracker, which is a really good thing. <laughs> right, exactly. I keep the shoe Amazing. to start the conversation. Wow. What I'm missing in my collection is that there weren't point shoes made in different skin tones. I have PowerPoints on the inclusiveness in ballet, but I don't yet have a pair, so. I want to say that Gaynor Minden was the first that came out with true nude color point shoes. And then Freed followed suit a couple years later. That was a much bigger splash in the media. So Gaynor Minden was doing it, I think, years before Freed came on. Freed has taken over the universe in some ways. Right. But I like the idea that somebody somewhere is working on a point shoe that lasts longer, is better to your feet. I'm behind all new technologies yes. that can make this go better. Yes, it's the combination of the traditional and the innovation, and I think they were truly the first to innovate in the ballet shoe industry. Now, there's a lot of other companies that are kind of doing similar things. So they've really changed the game in the ballet world. Well, I want the next Space Age shoe to compare it to it. all of these that uh, die so quickly. Oh my gosh, I love it. I love it so much though. Thank you so much for showing us some of your point shoe collection. <laughs> I really appreciate the interest and your expertise. <laughs> Thank you so much. Jennifer wrote two books. One is called Ballet Matters, the other is Nutcracker Nation. If you want to learn a little bit more about that, you can find that on the link below. So if you're interested in getting some of these books and learning a little bit more about ballet history, we'll have that all for you guys. 